is the largest human impact on the planet. Like WWF and 80 Acres Farms, Blue Lab envisions a food system that meets the needs of both people and nature. But to get there, we must decrease the environmental impacts of food production. Today, we'll hear from Eric and Julia about the challenges and the opportunities. Our purpose at Blue Lab is to contribute to those opportunities and to be part of the solution. We are committed to educating and empowering the indoor and CEA farmers of today and tomorrow, which is why this webinar series will tackle the hard questions and work to build community with our growers, resellers, and global industry thought leaders who share our vision of growing for a healthier world. So yes, we face real challenges and it's best to face them head on and to recognize that only by working together can we overcome them. Blue Lab has been focused on this for some time. For 30 years, Blue Lab has been the industry standard for high precision measurement technology to maximize crop performance and minimize waste. Through our innovative products, growers measure, monitor, and control the fundamental parameters of growing success, pH, EC, temperature, and moisture for CEA. And like you, we insist on separating fact from fiction when determining which technologies and practices work best for the full range of growing applications. And with that, I am delighted to ask our panelists to introduce themselves to you. We'll start with Julia Kernick, Director of Innovation Startups for World Wildlife Fund, and then turn to Eric Elistad, Vice President of Research and Development for 80 Acres Farms. Over to you, Julia. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline and, and Blue Lab for having me. Uh, so as, as was just mentioned, I'm Julia Kernick. I am with the Markets Institute team at the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, and I, I realize it can be a little bit strange to hear World Wildlife Fund engaged in an in indoor agriculture project, but we'll, we'll get into that in a second when I uh, talk to you a little bit more in my presentation. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, Julia. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, we've been partners of Blue Lab for many years, so it's exciting to get to have this conversation, talk about where indoor farming and controlled environment agriculture has come from, uh, what are the challenges, and, and where do we go from here? So um, as you said, my, my name is Eric Ellistad, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Development for 80 Acres Farms. Um, means I get to work on developing uh, new crops, new species, new products, and uh, ultimately trying to improve our growing methods um, both to deliver value to the consumer and also to um, reduce resource consumption and tackle the core of a lot of the topics of the, today. So very excited to be here and excited for the conversation. Great. Uh, I think I think that's back to me now. Uh, although I'm looking at Caroline for for a nod. Uh, and, and Eric, always great to, to be Thank presenting you. with you. It's always a, a great opportunity. Uh, so as I mentioned, I, I get a lot of questions on why WWF, a lot of surprise. Uh, I am not talking about pandas uh, today. I, I don't work with pandas, much to most people's disappointment, uh, including my own. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited that I do get to work uh, with uh, the indoor agriculture uh, team and industry. Uh, so my specific group at WWF is called the Markets Institute, and we look at major issues, tools, and trends that are facing the food, agriculture, and soft commodity worlds, uh, and then try to dig into those where we think we can bring some value add, often through our convening power and coalition building, elevating issues that are otherwise not perhaps getting attention. Uh, and my specific role within that is on the more entrepreneurial end of looking for new business models and new business strategies that are not only environmentally sustainable and socially beneficial, but also financially profitable. Because uh, we don't own anything, we don't manage anything at the end of the day. We want to help come up with new ideas, perhaps pilot them, bring teams together, but success for us is when it can continue to scale and grow beyond us and to hopefully bring about change quite quickly for all of the reasons that Caroline was already outlining, uh, outlining in her introduction. 
around uh, the, the need to act quickly and agriculture's footprint on the environment. Uh, and so in this case, we're really attracted to the indoor agriculture industry because of all the promise it brings. Uh, I'm sure that this is not an audience that I have to you know, share any of those virtues, but you know, things around reduced food loss and food waste, water savings, lack of pesticide use, uh, you know, much lower land use and avoiding land conversion, and the ability to put food in places that otherwise are food insecure and cannot grow food. So there's a, a huge number of benefits. Obviously, it's an industry attracting a lot of attention, a lot of excitement that is, it is no pun intended, but growing. Uh, but we wanted to come in because it's also an early stage industry uh, and it faces some hurdles. Uh, I would say the two largest, one around labor where we don't feel that we have a lot of expertise. And I know Eric will talk about some of the advances 80 Acres has been making there. And so I don't think we have anything to, to add, but the other one is around the energy footprint. Uh, these farms do use a lot of energy, which is both an environmental concern as well as a financial one. Uh, and one of the reasons that you really only see leafy greens and herbs grown most of the time in these systems right now. So not a technical challenge, but a, an energy one. And so we wanted to see if we could be helpful from that standpoint in improving on the industry, bringing partners together in new ways, and then hopefully seeing the entire industry scale and tackle a lot more types of fruits and vegetables and how we grow specialty produce. With that in mind, we completed a, a phase one project and I'm sharing, want to share some results from both phase one and phase two today. Phase one was really trying to establish a baseline and look at where we are today uh, and to understand, you know, what, what kind of levers can we be pulling? And so with that in mind, we looked a little bit about the state of the industry and where we were. We conducted a life cycle analysis uh, to understand how different systems compare to each other as well as conventional farming to give us those understanding of levers to pull. And then we actually began looking at bringing a, a farm to fruition. Uh, and that will be happening in St. Louis as part of phase two. And we chose St. Louis for a number of reasons. We wanted an urban population. Uh, so uh, at least a million or more people in the metropolitan statistical area. We wanted a place with seasonality, so you can't already grow food there year-round outdoors. Uh, we wanted a place with quite a few stranded assets, and that's something I'll talk a lot, a lot more in, in a minute as I show some of the strategies we've looked at in phase two. Uh, and then we wanted, we, we really saw St. Louis as bringing unique benefits around plant science expertise. Uh, and I, I know Eric will touch on some of that, but there, we've been optimizing seeds for outdoor growth forever. Uh, and the plant science expertise in St. Louis is pretty unusual and could really bring a lot of advances as well around energy as well as other areas. Uh, so we're quite excited about that too. I did want to share a few of the LCA results here to look at that energy footprint uh, and the larger sort of aspects that we did find. Uh, it will have a St. Louis angle, uh, as you'll see, since our project is based there. So we are comparing four different indoor agriculture systems. Uh, so a in hydroponics, uh, both in a greenhouse setting and in a vertical setting. And so vertical to us, we defined as you know using all artificial lighting, uh, and then comparing aquaponics again in a greenhouse and vertical setting. And all of those would be situated in St. Louis in this hypothetical and comparing it to conventionally grown lettuce grown in California, which in the US is where we grow most of our lettuce, and then shipping that to St. Louis. Uh, and so I'm just going to pull up a few results from that here. Looks so, I'm, I'm sorry, was there? The slides look great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good to know. Uh, just, and, and I don't have to stare at myself now, so it's an added bonus. Uh, but um, as you can see here, you know, the systems I described were looking at the greenhouse gas emissions. And this is really driven by the energy use. So it does include the much, much lower food loss and food waste. It includes the much lower transportation. But the energy really drives two areas that lead to this greenhouse gas emissions, and you can see that even accounting for those benefits of indoor farming, conventional lettuce has a much, much lower footprint. That is both from the direct energy use itself, uh, so the fact, especially with a 
you know, fully indoor farm. You can see it's a bit better with the, the greenhouse here and the light turquoise. Uh, but with a fully indoor farm, you use a lot of lights uh, when you're replacing the sun. Uh, but it also matters where that energy is coming from. So as I said, our, you know, example hypothetical farms here in St. Louis, and they're being compared to lettuce grown in California. And it turns out that perhaps not surprisingly, California has a much, much cleaner energy grid than St. Louis does. Uh, so California has almost half of their energy is renewable and St. Louis is very coal heavy. So it's not just that the farms, the indoor farms are using more energy, but a kilowatt of energy used in St. Louis brings a larger greenhouse gas footprint than a kilowatt of energy used in California because of where that energy is coming from. Uh, and that's a theme that's coming out over and over here is it's not just the amount of energy being used, but where that energy is sourced from. We also took a look at land use. You can see it changes pretty drastically here. Now conventional lettuce does not do as well and the hydroponics do very well. Uh, perhaps not too surprising. Uh, I do get a lot of questions around why is aquaponics so high? And that is because this includes both direct land use, which is where the farm is situated, which is very, very low, but also indirect land use. Uh, so in this case, it means the land that would be used to feed the, to grow and source tilapia feed, for example. And that comes out at, at very high numbers. We took a look at water use as well. Uh, and here uh, you can see some of the advantages to, to uh, indoor agriculture. Uh, aquaponics, again, both through direct and indirect water use, doesn't do quite as well as hydroponics, but all four indoor systems compare favorably to conventionally grown lettuce. We then wanted to compare a variety of, you know, social and environmental impacts. Uh, I will say this is definitely a U.S. lens here because we had to choose some kind of weighting since we are looking at a St. Louis farm. We chose a St. Louis weighting, uh, you know, in U.S. focused lens, uh, since you obviously can't compare human health to water use directly. Uh, so if you're in other areas uh, where, it, you know, there's different priorities, if water's not available, if land's not available, if there, you know, it's a country that can't grow its own food, some of these trade-offs might be quite different in how these are weighted in comparison. Uh, but as you can see here with the sort of weights we were using with that U.S. and St. Louis lens, conventional lettuce does turn out to, to do better across the board. Uh, a lot of that comes down again to not just the energy use, which is very important, but the energy mix. So when you're looking, for example, at the human health and ecosystem impact, a lot of that comes from the dirtier energy mix. And so with that in mind, we then, here we, we looked at for solar energy and overlay it here for solar energy and then grayed out in the background what it was on the previous slide with the current energy mixes. And the goal here was to look at even if indoor farms are using the same amount of energy that they're using now, but if they are sourcing it all from a you know, solar and clean energy system, what would those effects look like? And you can see, even with that, even with the same energy footprint of the farms themselves, the hydroponic systems now do very well here. Uh, so their impact drops, and it is a lower impact than you see in that conventionally grown lettuce. Julia, if you don't mind, I'm just going to pause you there so that we can take a question from a member of the audience. Sure. And that question is, can you explain the X and Y axes on these slides? Sure, so I will pull them back up. I stopped for a second here. So the the y axis here is a it's basically a unit of impact. Uh, so it is uh, it's not something you know neatly defined and across all of them, you can see it's that MPT. And really, that means unit of impact. And that's again, so that we could have a standard that you can compare across things that are dire not directly comparable. Uh, so, you know, with greenhouse gas emissions, you can't compare CO2 to, you know, gallons of water used directly. So this is how whenever you do a life cycle analysis, commonly you have a almost, you know, human made uh, sort of fake way of comparing uh, that allows us to do that. The X axis are the different systems that I had mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so conventional lettuce all the way on the left 
compared to the you know greenhouse hydroponics, greenhouse aquaponics, a vertical hydroponic farm, and a vertical aquaponic farm. Terrific, thank Enjoy you. That. Okay. And so we, you know, completed this phase one study, and it, this is really meant to be a snapshot. So I, I will be the first one to say here, uh, and I, I am sure that others will have some thoughts on this. The goal wasn't to say, you know, this is the be all, end all, and this is uh, where the industry is and will remain. That is not at all our goal. Uh, it was meant to give us a little bit of understanding of the levers so we could understand what can we start to pull, uh, where can we be helpful and where can we intervene. Uh, and that really led us into phase two. Uh, so in phase two, we wanted to take this research and bring it to life. So we built a, a coalition. I'm very happy to say Eric was was absolutely a part of that in 80 Acres uh, and put together the sort of coalition of people in St. Louis, of practitioners, of people connected to the industry, but also a lot of St. Louis people. Uh, so, you know, hospitals, universities, community development groups, uh, certainly plant science experts from, you know, places like Bayer and the Danforth Plant Science Center uh, and all the great uh, companies there, uh, you know, professors and experts across uh, a variety of relevant fields and, and many others I'm sure I'm forgetting at the moment and apologize for doing so. And the goal was to begin to understand what partnerships can we form and how can we make use of different assets uh, to bring a farm to life that makes use of innovation, partnerships, and existing and stranded assets to drive down this energy footprint and be socially beneficial. I call it sort of a, a partner or pilot demo farm. We want it to be a commercially viable farm. So the goal here is not something small. It's also not something we would be owning, uh, but something we hope to partner to, to bring to life. Uh, but I want to say it's a demo in that it will be doing something in a little bit of a different way uh, and showing hopefully an example of how can you approach these farms and this industry and how can you think differently as you put them together. Uh, so we'll be releasing our phase two report probably within the next month. It goes through all of those in great detail, far more detail than I'll be showing here. So I, I will look forward to sharing that with everyone. And we'll share both the one that is coming to life in St. Louis, but also all of these other reasons. Uh, and that we didn't use others and where they may be viable. Because again, St. Louis is an example here, but not meant to be uh, the, the end of our involvement. And so I am gonna pull up a few slides again to, to briefly share. I will not bore everyone with the deep science here. I'm a nerd, I like the science, uh, but I, I will not bore everyone here with all of the technical aspects, but wanted to share a few of the, the ideas we're considering. And those really fall into two buckets. One is looking at using more renewable energy as our solar example showed. The other is looking at driving down and using less energy. Uh, so sort of two different integration aspects. And I'll start with the renewable energy ones. So hopefully you can see my slides again here. We do, they look great, thank you. Perfect, I can take no credit for that. I did not make them, but uh, thank you. And so the, one of the you know renewable options we looked at, uh, since this is taking place in St. Louis, uh, is the you know utter underwater wind turbines. So this is a very new technology. Uh, they basically look like windmills, but as opposed to being above ground, they're in the water and are churned by the water flow. And so we looked at could you put some of these in the Mississippi River? St. Louis is right along it, and fuel a farm that way. Uh, while technically the answer is yes, uh, it turns out that the economics are not there yet. It's a very nascent industry. On this chart, I show a variety of different systems of underwater turbines and what those costs would be. And you can see the cheapest one here comes out to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. And St. Louis has a commercial energy rate around six cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so almost a third of the price. Uh, you also would have the upfront costs here. Uh, of building underwater wind turbine, water turbines. So may not make sense here, but this is something in our report, a great example of how we go into detail and analyze where would it make sense? Uh, and perhaps areas with faster water flow where the costs will get cheaper, the Mississippi is pretty slow, uh, and also areas uh, that have higher electricity rates. So in particular islands. We did look at solar, uh, which we mentioned in our hypothetical sort of a scenario there of the life cycle analysis. And this looks at the costs of solar. 
uh, specific to Missouri here. Uh, and you can see that solar is the one in yellow. Uh, it has dropped a lot recently and we expect it to continue to drop. So it's right around natural gas right now, which is the orange. Uh, and it's actually below coal, which is gray, which dominates St. Louis's current energy supply. On, you know, that, that looks really positive and really exciting. And, and it is positive and exciting. I will give the caveat that, uh, two caveats. One is this looks at the, you know, the cost of the energy, but not the upfront costs. Uh, so right now there is plenty of capacity in St. Louis and in Missouri using existing coal power plants. Uh, you would have to build a solar, you know, field. So the there is the the additional upfront cost there that would not be present with coal, and it would you would have to have someone in, you know, put in that money, uh, whether it is a farm or a utility. Uh, there's also the lands, you know sort of space to be considered. The number of solar panels needed to run a very large farm uh, would far dwarf the size of the farm itself. So it's not something like, oh, I can just put it on the roof. In an area with lots of land like Missouri, that may very well be feasible. But in areas where land is at a premium, that may not make sense. And the last one in this sort of bucket we looked at was one I'm very excited about, which is actually creating energy from food waste. Uh, and this is a diagram from a company called Somax Bioenergy, uh, who does just that. Uh, and what's to me very exciting about this is you can take any kind of food waste. So it's not just things that are compostable or similar. You can take proteins and bones and oils and mixed food waste in addition to all of the compostable food waste. Uh, which means you're not only creating energy in a green way, but you're actually cutting down on food waste sitting in landfills that would otherwise be producing methane emissions. Uh, so a, a large farm could be run with the amount of food waste that is generated in St. Louis. Uh, and this goes through it in more detail, happy to walk through it later, but I um, want to be cognizant of, of time and, and an interest as well. We then looked at some integrations to cut down on energy use in the first place, as I said, and so a few examples here of that too. One is that St. Louis does have a lot of these coal power plants that are going to be retired uh, over the next couple years and next couple decades. A lot of them actually use the Mississippi River to cool the power plant right now. So there's existing infrastructure to take the river to run it through the coal power plant. And so we wanted to see, could you use that infrastructure to instead use the river to cool the farm? So taking something that's already existing and getting retired, but repurposing it. From a science and tech aspect, the answer is yes, you absolutely can. Uh, there are some environmental considerations. There's a lot of ash ponds in these areas, and there will be some costs involved in converting it, probably more than a farm would find cost effective to do. Uh, but it's possible that this is the type of thing that could get government or other funding to do so. St. Louis would work, but it might be more feasible in other areas. The Mississippi River is only cold enough about six months of the year to be useful. Uh, so it would still be nice, uh, but it would only cut down on that energy use for half of the year. And so it makes the costs less useful too. Uh, so doing this in an area where the water is colder or even just deeper, the Mississippi River is pretty shallow and the deeper the water gets, the cooler it is even in the summer. We also looked at using abandoned mines. Uh, so there's about half a million abandoned mines across the US alone, not to mention the rest of the world. Uh, and there are some former limestone mines in the St. Louis area. Uh, this is a solution we're very actively exploring and continuing to, to look into as a site in St. Louis right now. Uh, and the advantage to this is the, you see the above ground portion here, but you know mines are underground or inside mountains and you have much cooler ambient temperatures. Uh, often around, you know, perhaps mid 50s Fahrenheit year round. So you decrease the need for the HVAC piece of the energy use in the first place. Uh, and that's because your energy use comes not only from direct lighting in vertical farms, but also from sort of indirect lighting energy use, which is because all of those lights create a lot of excess heat, even in winter, even in cold climates. Uh, and so you end up using a lot of air conditioning. Uh, and this would help negate quite a lot of that. We then looked at two co-locating options, uh, which I'll briefly go through here. The first one is looking at whether you can capture carbon dioxide uh, from a co-located entity and use it in the farm. 
So it's not that you are lowering the energy use of the farm in total and aggregate, but more CO2 can increase yields. And so you might be able to decrease the energy emissions per pound of produce grown while also capturing CO2 that would otherwise be going into the atmosphere. St. Louis has a, quite a few breweries for any of you who are familiar with St. Louis. And so we were specifically modeling this for capturing CO2 emissions from breweries, but you could do it for other entities as well. Uh, the technology is absolutely there. The costs depend on the uh, other sort of factors involved, such as if it is a, you know, a coal system that's dirtier and needs more scrubbers, it gets a lot more expensive. With a brewery, it's a lot more affordable. So more sort of site-specific research needs to be done, but it is something worth exploring. And Julie, I do see you. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're responding to the questions as well. Great. I'll let you go ahead with that. Yeah, I'll tackle that one. And then and then this is my the last one to share here is the heat capture. So I see a question at um, about the food waste uh, and whether how it is sort of collected in urban environments. Uh, so this is absolutely doable in an urban environment. SOMAX is building its first facility in an urban environment. Uh, just outside of Philadelphia uh, that is underway right now. Uh, so the I, I didn't get into all of the technical aspects and I'm happy to, to send them out if it's of interest afterwards, but there are a slew of byproducts uh, that come out of that, some of which are very useful, some of which ultimately do have a little bit of disposal, but it's very low. Almost everything can be repurposed. Uh, and so all of that is accounted in both the costs and the environmental footprint, uh, and it comes out very positively. Uh, we did not look at hydrostatic energy storage in the mines, uh, which is a question. Uh, so something I'm happy to look into more, but we haven't at this point. Uh, and I see a great question about food waste. So I'll tackle that and then I'll, I'll do heat and then Caroline, let me know if I'm taking up too much time. But um, it asked about incorporating food waste into the calculations. We did. So we assumed 80% less food waste in all indoor farms than in conventional farms. So you're absolutely right. A lot more waste occurs when you're shipping food from California, but it is still a much, it, it is dwarfed by the sort of energy use of indoor farms and the source of that energy. Uh, so the St. Louis grid. Uh, so the the last one we looked at for driving down sort of energy footprint was capturing that excess heat I just mentioned in some of the previous slides. Uh, so that could be a stranded asset in and of itself. And can you capture that heat and use it productively? In St. Louis, this is again one we're looking into it very actively right now. And we're looking at capturing it and using it in a nearby school. Uh, the costs here depend a lot on how far away it is. So I show a little diagram of, of how it could work. Uh, and the answer is that it, it is potentially very cost feasible depending on the distance. Uh, so for a large farm to be situated in St. Louis, it would produce a little under $900,000 of heat at St. Louis prices annually. Uh, the piping itself to get the heat, you know, the equipment to get the heat to a co-located school, if you're looking at a a smaller distance of about one kilometer, it would be about $270,000. So it would, you know, immediately sort of have a, a payback. Even up to 15 kilometers, you're looking at uh, a much higher investment, closer to 4 million, but that would have a payback period of under five years. Uh, could, so could still very much be worth it and could potentially bring additional revenue to a farm. Uh, savings for a school, if you showed it at, sold it at less than the market rate, uh, but also the, boost in you know environmental sort of savings for everyone uh, since the farm itself would be using less heat than it would be doing otherwise. Uh, so again, not that the farm would be using less energy, but the total would be less. Uh, so I realize that was a lot. Happy to to answer questions when it's appropriate, uh, but we'll we'll turn it over now to hear Hi. from I believe Eric. Terrific, Julie. I've got one more and probably a um, can be addressed by both of you, and then we can transition right into Eric's presentation, as I imagine he'll be addressing it in the content um, today. But um, so, Julia, um, you've really impressed upon us the importance of site centricity in designing a facility. 
Um, and um, it's clear that we're going to need to move away from big box cookie cutter style approaches. How do you suggest a grower get started in understanding what's available within a community that could be put to use for a new facility? And then Eric will, will direct that to you as well. I was going to say, Eric, Eric might be better situated for that. I mean, I, I hope that some of what we release in our phase two report, that's some of our goal. Uh, so it's to present a lot of ideas, not all of which are feasible in St. Louis by any means, but might be feasible somewhere. So we're hoping by sharing all of that information, it spurs people to explore some of those elsewhere uh, and to think about what those could look like uh, and get creative. We are also go into detail about that coalition we brought together and who was at it and how that worked because we're hoping that can also be a tool for farms uh, and others so that they can you know perhaps duplicate some of that process as well in different cities and different regions to get those you know less thought of partners and, and different people to the table who you might not normally reach out to but might be able to highlight what assets do exist in a community and come up with different innovative ideas. Excellent. We will be excited to see that next report. Thank you. Eric, we'll turn to you now. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Julia. That was that was exceptional. I love the work and I'm so excited that the World Wildlife Fund is putting its resources and expertise behind um, helping understand how indoor farming fits into these uh, you know, global problems and um, really making sure that we all recognize that we're part of a big broader community. And many of these issues are, are not going to be solved, you know, within the four walls of, you know, the growth chamber of an indoor farm. And it's really an ecosystem and a much more complex environment. And it is situational. So how do we start to uh, collaborate within the industry and then with the um, types of opportunities, energy partners um, and local um, developers that can help um, make sure that indoor farming turns into the reality of what, of what we think can be so. Very excited to share a little bit more about 80 Acres um, and kind of our a little bit of our story, um, which we think has a lot of lessons of the industry embedded within it. Um, what have the challenges been to um, get to where we are today? Um, what, what are we working on at the moment? And, and where do we see um, the future of the industry going? And, and where do we see opportunities to um, deliver more value to our consumers, um, but as well as start to tackle at a greater scale um, the sustainability issues to make sure we're good stewards of, of the environment uh, and delivering a product in a responsible way. So I will share my screen. If you're looking at the presentation. Yeah. Looks terrific, Eric. Wonderful, wonderful. So a little bit about um, 80 acres to start with. So. Um, 80 Acres was founded by Mike Zelkind and Tisha Livingston, who um, had spent their an entire career um, working in uh, the food industry, uh, specifically building and leading some, some of the largest um, uh, big food companies out there, Dole, Del Monte, Conagra, um, Advanced Pure Foods. Um, so they had been working um, to source products from farmers, not just in the United States, but around the world and really working with a lot of the challenges of what managing a global food supply chain looks like. Um, so they saw up close and firsthand uh, not only what the challenges were for their producers and their suppliers, but really what the impact was on the food system and how much um, had to be compromised um, around predictability of supply, the quality of supply, and then the environmental burden that that whole supply chain placed on all the operators. Um, and ultimately the consumer um, was not being delivered the product that they were looking for in many cases. And so with a lot of these lessons under their belt, um, they began looking for solutions, um, looking at the indoor farming industry, looking at greenhouses, um, and ultimately uh, decided to found 80 Acres. Um, so 80 Acres was, was founded with the the mission to build a better food system, which is a very high level and audacious goal, um, but to really look to um, localize food production, um, implement uh, modern technologies to create opportunities to grow that food in, in a new way, um, while also tackling the um, sustainability side of the equation 
and looking to leverage um, opportunities to reduce the consumption of production, and then the negative externalities of downstream distribution uh, and many other issues that, um, that are faced by outdoor farming. And ultimately looking to build a scalable version of this. So um, as we talk about sustainability, um, we also need to be thoughtful about the economics, um, which is indoor farming is a very exciting and, and novel industry. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it has to be able to make money for the operators in it and be able to sell products to the consumer at a price that they're willing to afford. Um, so how do we begin to tackle the um, unit economics um, of the production within a farm and, and make sure that we're growing not just um, lettuce and leafy greens and high value herbs, uh, but really delivering a um, product line and a portfolio that is addressing challenges uh, and making sure we're adding value to those products as we do it. Um, so one, one thing that I like to, like to just acknowledge, which is indoor uh, vertical farming or controlled environment agriculture um, is in the news quite a bit nowadays. It's getting a lot of hype. Um, and I think uh, sometimes that um, it may seem like there's a, a headline every single day and it feels a little like clickbait um, every once in a while. So um, I find it valuable to, to zoom back and say, look, there are some, some very important reasons why indoor farming is um, in the spotlight at the moment um, and some trends that are driving it forward, both at the global level, um, looking at growing populations and increasing urbanization um, and the um, complexity that is introduced into the supply chains and production systems that service them. Um, and I think with COVID all still uh, on top of our minds, um, thinking about the resiliency of our supply chains, um, how, how able are they to withstand shocks um, and then ultimately, are we delivering to the consumer really what they're looking for? Um, and the consumer is increasingly looking for something that is clean, healthy, good for them, good for their, for, for their family, and good for the planet. And so we think there's opportunities to um, add something to the food system in each of these categories, um, and that uh, indoor farming is aspiring to be um, a solution alongside a lot of um, incumbents and the folks who've been working the industry for a very long time. So these are some of the categories that we try to keep on top of our minds as we make decisions about building our business. But one, one thing that is front and center, which is how do we improve the quality of product for the consumer? And over the last 60, 70 years, um, especially again, a little bit of a US, US centric uh, approach given where we're based, uh, much of our product um, fruits and vegetables are grown in California or Arizona or Mexico, and so um, transported across across the country. And so those food miles translate directly into um, time from harvest um, to the consumer to the market. And so with that transport, it requires packaging. Um, more hands touching product leads to increased degradation and food waste. Um, the transit has not just a fuel consumption component. Um, but a duration and more product degradation. And ultimately, you know, over half of the fresh produce grown in North America uh, doesn't even make it to the consumer. Um, and that that does frequently has very little shelf life left. And so the food waste at the consumer level is stacked on top. Uh, so you're not only creating waste, but cost and reduced quality to the consumer. So as we think about the, the business model, um, we first off need to design a farm that can, that can grow differently. So how do we find a way to um, increase yields per square foot while improving the quality of that product? And then from a business model standpoint, how do we integrate that farm into a local food system in a way to um, minimize the downstream distribution, time to market, and complexity of that supply chain? So frequently we will integrate these farms directly with the distribution centers or supply chain infrastructure of our food service and retail partners in order to make sure people get product in days instead of weeks, um, and really in some cases dramatically extending the shelf life and the freshness and all of the attributes that come with that to the consumer. We've also uh, began to hear loud and clear from our customers um, that they're looking for a lot from their food and, and are not always getting that today. And so from the customer standpoint, they're looking for year-round availability, high quality and consistency. The consumer is looking for flavor and nutrition, um, and everyone's looking for a price that's affordable. Um, and I think for indoor farming, it, it's important to recognize that cost is not everything. 
um, and that the value that the product can drink can bring needs to be affordable, um, but really outperform on the quality side of things as well as be affordable on the on the cost side of things. Consumers are looking for a product that comes from um, was grown in a way that they understand and value, uh, was produced um, and delivered to them with transparency, and that there is a level of ethicalness and um, traceability and transparency in that supply chain. So I think vertical farming can um, has, has something to offer in each of these categories. Um, and we're increasingly hearing from our consumers, especially as we're now um, getting mass distribution and we really are getting product into the hands of many people today. So we're really trying to listen to them. What are they looking for? What do they want their food to look like, taste like? How do they want it grown? And what are the values that they're gonna recognize and begin to support um, and not just purchase for the dollar, but vote with their dollar for uh, the type of food system that they want to work with uh, and the type of future that they want to live in. So we, we've talked about the, the growth and nascency of the industry. I think looking at the um, trajectory of 80 acres and what its iterative evolution was is, is a very interesting test case. Um, when I first started working in, in vertical farming uh, nearly a decade ago, um, they were just introducing the first uh, commercial horticultural LED. Um, it was expensive, it wasn't very efficient, um, you didn't have wavelength control or dimmability. And so if you built not only a financial model for indoor farm, but really looked at the resource consumption, um, it didn't seem to make sense. So fast forward to today, there's been dramatic improvements in the energy efficiency of the lighting systems. Um, a lot of evolution in the understanding of the growing methods and how to really leverage the control and precision of an indoor farm uh, to get a benefit from, um, from your crops um, and as well as uh, much better engineering around energy efficiency, understanding the fluid dynamics of inside of a farm. And so as we got going back in 2015 and 2016, um, we started at a small scale. We understood we didn't know everything and wanted to test um, all of the systems out there and begin to study the crops. And we also recognized that leafy greens was, was not sufficient um, to build the indoor farming company um, that we saw. And so we immediately began working on uh, designing systems around growing vine crops, and we started with tomatoes. And so we built um, one of the world's first indoor soil source lighting uh, vine crop production facilities in Ohio. And we've been growing and selling tomatoes ever since then. We also recognized that there was a rapidly evolving um, set of equipment and engineering um, challenges that needed to be solved. So we began designing and iterating through improvements in the layout, construction, process flow, hydroponic systems, HVAC systems, um, and lighting for a wide range of crops, um, and ultimately began to uh, then evolve our growing methods within those evolving systems. So in 2019, we actually took a, an abandoned building and converted it into um, a demonstration of our next generation tomato vine facility, which is still operating today in Ohio, um, and also began to rapidly integrate automation solutions into many of the process steps um, from seed to harvest and into packaging. So in 2019, we also built an automated leafy greens farm uh, that began to demonstrate improved yields and improved unit economics. Um, in addition, we built a, uh, a small vine farm actually on Fifth Avenue next to the Guggenheim as part of a partnership with them in order to introduce uh, some of the concepts of indoor vertical farming in conjunction with the Guggenheim. Uh, and this farm was actually operated, it was launched right there uh, before the pandemic hit. And so we had a grower who actually kept it running um, all the way through. We donated produce to some local nonprofits to support uh, to support folks in need through that phase. So um, again, another story of the resilience of indoor farming. Um, and ultimately, as we began to prove and validate um, the yields, the growing methods, improve the energy efficiency and economics, uh, and automate the process, um, we have recently built and, and commissioned to begin selling product out of um, our latest farm, which we call our 70K reference design, which is in a lot of ways the culmination of the learnings of many of those early facilities, um, many iterations of improvement in the growing methods around those crops. Um, it is, it is 70,000 square feet of production. Um, it's gonna deliver over a million and a half pounds of product per year. 
Um, and today it is delivering product to over 400 retail stores. Um, so as we think about what this industry is gonna start to look like um, at scale, um, we think this facility is really a, a benchmark for how we can really look at what the best in class energy efficiency is, um, cost efficiency from seed all the way through to finished good package. Um, and this facility actually we're very proud is uh, pulling from 100% renewable energy from local hydroelectric facility in Hamilton, Ohio. So we think it is, is a test case in how some of the right partnerships, especially some of the ones that Julia was mentioning, um, can actually take indoor farming um, with an energy efficient approach combined with a renewable energy solution and actually create an incredibly positive sustainability story um, that is a model to go forward with. So we are very excited about this. And um, Tracy, I think you have a, a, a video um, to show that'll show you a little bit more about the facility and the story behind it. While we're queuing that up, Eric, I just want to say how exciting it is to see how you are putting into practice some of those concepts that Julia described. Really fantastic work. Thank you. It, it's it's exciting to see it come to come to fruition, and um, it's taken a village. I think that's that's the message: is no company by themselves. We didn't do this by ourselves. We have many partners, and we've um, we've uh, learned and failed many times. Um, and you learn from that. You integrate and you move forward. So I'm very excited to see what the future will hold um, as we as we continue to see that trend in the future. And. Could this be the key to our urban farming needs? The concept has been around for decades, but only really commercialized in recent years and limited to growing just salad leaves. That's not going to sustain a city. But one innovative company is looking to shake up the industry. This is what a modern tomato farmer looks like. Plants don't lie. When a tomato tastes this good, that's what makes a difference. This is 80 Acres Farms, a big player in the rapidly growing business of vertical farming, specializing in converting urban spaces into urban farms. I'll start. Go ahead. And then you'll correct it. I will. Founded in 2015 by Mike Zelkind and Tisha Livingston. We had to give the consumer the right product at the right time at the right price with a phenomenal quality that 10 years ago was not feasible. Technology wasn't here 10 years ago to enable indoor vertical farming. The vertical farming industry continues to evolve. We continue to get better with the technology. The cost of LED lights and the cost of the rest of the technology continues to go down. Um, so it's becoming more affordable to build a highly efficient indoor farm. Expected to be valued at over 12 billion US dollars by 2026, the industry has come a long way in a short space of time. Mike and Tisha now want to push vertical farming to the next level. It's almost impossible to grow tomatoes indoors, and as you can see, we've been able to do it. It's all about the LED lights above us. It's all about making sure that you have nice laminar airflow so the plants can breathe. We're the first people in the world to grow tomatoes in a completely indoor environment with no sunlight. The reason we want to do it is we feel tomatoes and berries are really the, the killer app of the vertical farming space. We, we call it getting beyond lettuce. Leafy greens are well known for providing vitamins and minerals to our diet, but these fruit provide something extra. More calories for us and higher value for the farmer, important in our busy cities. We felt it was a way to tell the world that, hey, vertical farming has arrived. And to push the industry, to push other pioneers in the space to do more than leafy greens. It took years to do, but now that it's done, we can build these everywhere around the world, no matter what the climate is, and produce these phenomenal crops. Ten years ago, this was science fiction. Tomorrow is going to be so ubiquitous that everybody's going to be doing it, and we will think, oh my god. Did we really ship our berries 2,000 miles a few years ago? How crazy, who would have thought of that? 
But Mike and Tisha are by no means finished there. Hi, welcome to the 70K farm. This is their most ambitious project yet. This is certainly going to be one of the largest fully automated farms in the US. It's about 55 feet high. We have 10 rows, 10 levels, 10 positions deep. In just 70,000 square feet, this vertical farm will robotically plant, harvest, and package almost 1.5 million pounds of produce annually. Being able to provide healthy, nutritious food and doing it in a sustainable way and doing it in an affordable way so people can get this food is something that's really important. It's my belief that this farm is going to change the world. Exciting. So, so that's a little bit of a, a, a sneak peek inside the, the 70K facility, which uh, after that video was filmed, has, has now been completed, um, commissioned, and uh, is, is delivering product. So we are very excited. We are very busy. Um, and it is exciting to, to, to see our products actually on shelf being delivered um, at uh, over 400 retail locations across the Midwest. Um, so this is a little snapshot of our product line, um, growing a range of salads, leafy greens, herbs, um, cucumbers, tomatoes, and um, an increasing category of value-added products, um, and quite a bit of um, coming down the pipeline as well. So as we look at leafy greens, um, one opportunity that we see is to improve the flavor and especially the nutrient density. Um, a lot of these products are the heroes of the nutritional world, providing not just uh, vitamins and minerals, but some extremely interesting bioactive compounds that are being connected to a lot of human health issues, including cancer. Um, also, we are uh, nearing commercialization of some of some other flowering and fruiting crops as well. So strawberries, peppers, um, and, and a few others will give you a sneak preview of that as well. So I think um, the trajectory that we saw for leafy greens where it took improved growing processes, improved yields, and better efficiencies year over year. Some of the other crops are further up those curves. So they are maybe where leafy greens were three, four, five years ago. But if you look at the trends and start to forecast out, um, indoor farming is increasingly going to be delivering uh, far more than leafy greens. I, I have that confidence. And so looking at sustainability, one of, one of the things that, that we, we, we did as a project is we went through the UN sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals and identified where, where we have relevance, um, where there is an overlap between 80 acres um, and these categories. And what we found is that there was a, a very large overlap, um, 12 actually of their 17 sustainable, sustainable development goals um, did we have relevance into. So obviously zero hunger, increasing access to fresh healthy food, um, increasing the nutrient density of that food, engaging local community um, and our internal employees um, with education, exposure to STEM topics, um, gender equality, um, and then obviously sustainable cities is a topic um, from here. So how do we think of indoor farming as a component of um, a circular economy um, within these increasingly complex urban areas? So as we, as we look at some of the metrics and KPIs, if you will, um, for how we start to benchmark ourselves, um, this was a, a study done by, by the Farm Tech Society uh, that started to try to benchmark some of the commonly claimed um, metrics around that have a relevant sustainability. So water consumption, um, productivity in um, yield per square meter per year, uh, and then obviously downstream distribution. So you can see a pretty um, dramatic improvement in the efficiency um, around water consumption, yield density, and then downstream distribution that um, Julia highlighted as well. So it is real, and I think greenhouses are a, a step towards vertical farming, vertical farming being at the kind of far end of that spectrum. So for us, as we realize that we care about our impact in a lot of these categories, um, something that we're actually trying to improve every day is how do we quantify that? How do we measure this? How do we set goals for ourselves internally? benchmark that, communicate that to our stakeholders, and then hold ourselves accountable. Um, so the elimination of applying pesticides and herbicides, um, we think is a huge impact um, in agriculture, and we're very proud of the fact that we don't use any. 
Um, gallons of water saved um, is, a, is, an imp is a major metric. Uh, and then obviously comparing product grown and distributed locally with extended shelf life um, to the amount of food waste in the upstream supply chain. Um, each pound that we sell um, translates through a certain amount of pounds that is avoided from food waste. Um, the yield density allows us to think about our production as preserving farmland uh, that can be used for another purpose or uh, converted to a more natural ecosystem. Um, all of the water used within our system is recaptured, including the moisture uh, that the plants transpire into the air. Um, and the effluent from the farm is uh, non-toxic uh, and able to be reintroduced back into the, into the water system. So we actually have no agricultural runoff and then obviously reducing the downstream distribution. So these are some of the metrics that we measure every, every day, every month, every year. Um, but we're, we're, we're not done. I, I think Julia highlighted there are still a lot of challenges and opportunities to uh, take this into the next level. Um, it's hard to talk about sustainability in food without acknowledging the plastic, which is kind of the elephant in, in the room a lot of the times. Selling to retail, it's hard to not use plastic, frequently impossible. Uh, but you can reduce how much you use, design your products using uh, post-consumer recycled plastic that is biodegradable. You can create rainwater capture. And there's a lot of other programs that we see as opportunities to drive improvement in the future. So um, I'll pause there. I, I think I probably ran over. So um, apologies for that. Um, and But we're very excited. And we think we're just getting going uh, in indoor farming. Uh, I think Mike Zelkin, our CEO, likes to say uh, we're probably in the bottom of the, of the second inning. So it's going to be a long game. And we're excited to be part of that community as we go forward. Thank you so much, Brian. I barely noticed that we were running over time because the presentation is so gripping. Um, but um, I do see that we have some questions from our audience. So I'd like to address at least a couple of these today. Um, but I do want to say that I know that um, there are some of you that need to run off to your next meeting. That's OK. We are recording. Um, and um, we thank the many, many of you that have been um, hanging in there right along with us. So, um, Julia, I've got a question um, from someone who um, clearly has read um, the WWF report and been listening attentively today. Um, and um, I'm just going to paraphrase broadly here, but um, what's um, the gist of this is that um, in your in your report, you talk about CEA as a new industry with quickly changing technology. And in your report, you draw the conclusion that um, as more money enters this space, it's going to propel more innovation, more companies to uh, coming together to tackle um, the challenges that you've addressed. And, and we certainly heard um, a great deal about that from Eric today. Um, but um, notably, you mentioned that individual farmers may need to change their mindset um, so that um, you know, it's not every every grower for themselves, but instead coming together as a community um, with an industry building uh, mentality. Um, and um, so, really, I think you know the question here is: How can a grower get started in in reaching out and finding other growers and other potential partners um, to to advance these initiatives? Any any thoughts on that? Uh, sure, and and I imagine Eric has a a more practitioner viewpoint on some of this. I realize it's very easy for me to stand here and encourage farms to work together because I am not a farm, <laughs> and so it's easy for me to say there are pre-competitive areas to cooperate. But I, you know, even though it's an industry that's quickly expanding, it's so tiny compared to agriculture as a whole, and so I think that advances for one farm are still very beneficial to all farms and sort of growing the entire industry and moving it forward. Uh, you know, we're trying to help that from the sort of energy standpoint uh, and we're beginning to see it a little bit. Uh, there were a few farms that, for instance, formed a, a coalition around food safety and sort of best practices there, which I think is a, a great one to see happening. Uh, but I, I do think there is room for more activities like that. Uh, so some best practices, some um, sharing of lessons learned. Uh, you know, obviously farms aren't going to share their secret sauce, uh, but you know, if there's some standardization so that each farm is not reinventing the wheel in terms of LED lighting, in terms of technology, in terms of grow recipes, in terms of safety, uh, in terms of sort of every aspect of that, I think it could help farms scale faster and have the bandwidth to tackle some of these other challenges.
Very good. Uh, and um, I'm seeing another question here um, from Will of Oregon. Um, and um, and Eric, I think um, this one is um, directed toward you. Um, you talked about um, how it really no longer um, makes sense to to make kind of an apples to apples comparison uh, between um, food grown in a CEA environment um, to uh, food grown in um, traditional historical field agriculture, uh, because we can expect so much more um, from CEA grown food. And um, the question here is, how much do consumers care? You know, do they care enough about these additional benefits, including reduced environmental impact, to pay a price premium for them? Any thoughts on that? And actually, a related question here. Do you anticipate that we will see more benefits possible through CEA growing methods in the future? Uh, custom designed food, for example. So a couple questions there, but we can pick them apart. Wonderful. Uh, the phenomenal questions. And I, and I think that is, that is um, really important to understand that not every head of lettuce is the same. Not every tomato is the same. Um, and so, you know, I think there are folks who think of produce as a commodity. And for them, it does boil down to the dollars and cents and which one has a lower um, CO2 equivalent today. But if you recognize that um, even looking at leafy greens, um, there is a wide difference in the nutritional value, in the flavor. Um, our tomatoes taste different. And so our customers care deeply um, about, about our tomatoes, and they're always demanding more for us. That's one of the fastest growing categories that we have. So I think when you, at the consumer level, I think the quality of the product and the attributes of the product um, might be the most important. And so I think the sustainability and the environmental impact um, of the production method um, is relevant. It's part of the conversation, but I think it's secondary. I think your your right to your right to win, your right to play on that shelf comes from your product quality and that you're delivering something that the consumer that they want. Um, and then they flip over the package, want to know, well, who are you? How do you grow? And how does this matter? So at that point, you you can still lose the game, but I think you need to get into the you know into the ball game with uh, with flavor, nutrition, and consumer value. And on the um, uh, I forget what the third question was, if you'll, if you'll remind me. So I think, you know, the, the next part of that question is, what more can we expect um, from um, CEA food? Um, can you envision a future in which um, food products are uh, custom designed um, to meet the needs of different kinds of consumers? Absolutely. What what we found is that um, our plants are highly responsive to the environment you grow them under. So Julia mentioned um, breeding and that many of the commercially available seeds, uh, the underlying genetics were developed for outdoor farming or in some cases for you know a greenhouse environment where there's a really high um, high value put on pest um, resistance, disease resistance, resistance to climate shocks and droughts. And so frequently there is a there is a biological trade-off. They had to give up some things in order to focus on those traits. And so as indoor farming, as, we, as, as this market grows and we develop our you know, deeper relationships with those breeders, we're gonna start to get you know, genetics that reintroduce those flavors, that have some attributes. And then with the ability to optimize the production environment, you can then accentuate the biochemical profiles of those crops. So I think looking at personal nutrition I think as the nutritional world um, adds some sophistication and starts to recognize that everyone's microbiome is different. And so, you know, a, a model diet is different depending on who you are, what your age is, age is, what your lifestyle is. And so I think, you know, the ability for under farming to select from a wider set of genetics and then optimize that production to target a certain um, food science profile in that product um, is going to enable us to start to customize food exactly like you talked about. So um, it is very exciting. That's some of the stuff I get to work on every day, which uh, is why I think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> it's possible that you do, Eric. Uh, so I think we could just go on and on. So it's reluctantly that um, I need to wrap up our session today. And uh, 
I really appreciate your time with us, Julia and Eric. Uh, really thought provoking. And um, thank you for helping us tackle today's questions. And thank you for your passion for moving our entire industry forward and your willingness to so candidly share your thoughts. And thank you too um, to our audience for your time today. Uh, you will receive an email with additional resources and a link to today's recording. And I invite you to visit us online at bluelab.com and to visit our blog, The Art of Growing. I look forward to seeing you all again on the 26th of May when we host our next Future of CEA event on the topic of Can We Grow More Food with Less Resources? A natural extension of today's topic. We'll see you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all so much.